Hello and welcome to the Archives and History Library. Before we begin tonight's lecture, I would like to mention the last two events that are coming up this year. On October 18th, Bernice Morris will speak about Carter G. Woodson and his new project on the, on the Woodson Cemetery. On Tuesday, December 6th, students from Billy Joe Payton's World War I class from West Virginia State University will present biographies of West Virginia soldiers that gave their life um, during that war. For other upcoming events, for, our, for next season's upcoming events, please check our, face, our webpage, wvculture.org backslash history or our Facebook page, which is West Virginia History Archives and History. Tonight, Dr. Damian Arthur will speak to us about uh, the late Robert C. Byrd. He was an intriguing person without peer. Dr. Arthur, Arthur is the author of Economic Actors, Economic Behaviors, and Presidential Leadership, The Constrained Effects of Re Re Rhetoric, co-author of Debating Immigration in the Age of Terrorism, Polarization, and Trump, he has published peer review articles in Presidential Studies Quarterly, White House Studies, and Socialist, Socialist help me out here, Sociological, Sociological Spectrum. Currently, he is writing the definitive biography on, uh, de definitive political biography on Robert C. Byrd. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Damian Arthur. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me come uh, talk with you tonight. It's good to see many of you that I know. Um, but before we get started, I'd just like to mention that um, uh, a lot of people to thank, because um, I have to, because they've given me money, so I have to tell them thank you. Um, the, the, let's see, uh, the Dirksen Congressional Research Grant, which is a really important foundation that gives money to, to research leadership in Congress. Um, the Robert C. Byrd Center for Congressional History, um, have, have been instrumental in, in the work that I'm doing for this. Uh, the Humanities Council, uh, West Virginia, and uh, the Political Science Department, COLA, and a number of other uh, folks have given me quite a bit of money, so the pressure is on to make this uh, come out better than I uh, ever anticipated. Um, but just a little little bit about the, the project. It's uh, Chuck asked me to bring the book if I had it. I, I wish I had the tangible book because I wish I were finished with it. Um, but it's it's still in the, the it's still in progress. Um, it's contracted with Oxford and it's due very soon. And so um, I've been working on that and and I'm knee deep in some of the the clan stuff right now. That's that's where I am in in terms of writing. Uh, tonight I'll talk to you a little bit about that, but mostly about his time on the appropriations. And I don't think that they are. Uh, mutually exclusive. I think they're very much related, uh, especially his ability to get on that committee, which was so important. Uh, had a lot to do with um, with his perspectives on race and and things like that. So um, we can um, we, we will talk a little bit about that. Um, and please, if I say something, you have a question, just ask me. And I'm used to the classroom and, and students doing that. So um, let's be as informal as we can. I like that. Um, in 2006, I had the opportunity to meet Robert C. Byrd. Uh, he was in Morgantown giving um, a talk about his autobiography that he had just released, uh, Child of the Appalachian Coalfields. He was at a local bookstore. And um, I was busy as a student and thought, you know, it'd really be cool to go meet him. I should. He's, he's such a consequential figure for the, for the state of West Virginia. And like most graduate students, I didn't go. Um, because I was busy and had all these other things to do, and I didn't think anything about it. I just thought, oh, well, whatever. Um, you know, he, he died six years after that, and, and I still hadn't been interested in his work or whatever, but, um, or his time. And eventually I did get interested in his uh, life, uh, which is another random story. Um, but I tell you this beginning because I think that's how most of us approach Robert C. Byrd is that we know about him. And especially when I tell students this, I say in class, because they know I'm writing his books, so I talk about him all the time. And most of them know two things about Robert Byrd. He brought a lot of money to the state of West Virginia and that he was in the Ku Klux Klan. And that's essentially all that they know. And I figure um, there is so much more to this man than those two things, although they are crucial and, and very important to who he is. But I think most of us approach him like, like I did as a graduate student. We, we know a little bit about him and we, and we think that this is uh, all that we should know. So um, 
we just we just move on with our lives. And I think we are missing something that is fundamental to our understanding of politics, fundamental fundamental to our understanding of uh, West Virginia history, as well as uh, to some extent American history, because this man had something to do with literally every major event uh, in American politics, and in some cases world politics, for the last half a century. Um, he came into the to the Senate the same year that Alaska and um, Hawaii joined the Union, um, and he was there ever since then. So he was there at the, um, uh, uh, he, he came into the Senate in 50, 58, well, 50, January 59, and then he died in 2010, and he was in the Senate for that entire time, that half a century, um, and that's before, he, whoops, he was, in the, he was in the House of Representatives for about 10 years prior to that, and then in the West Virginia politics a few years uh, before that as well. But nevertheless, um, I think that he's really important and that we should focus more on him. Uh, I don't know how much of you, everybody knows something about Robert Byrd, but just to give a little bit of background, he's the longest serving senator in American history. Um, he served nine consecutive terms from January the 3rd, 1959, until he died on June 28th in 2010. Um, he cast more votes in the Senate than any other member, nearly hitting 19,000 votes. Um, he was elected the Senate Majority Leader on two separate occasions. Minority, so he was Majority Leader in, in uh, 76 to 80, and the Reagan Revolution took over. He was Minority Leader the entire time during the Reagan administration from 1981 until um, about 86. He became Majority Leader again. And then um, he says he could have been elected majority leader again in 1988, but he decided to step down so that he could take the reins of the appropriations, the Senate Appropriations Committee. No other uh, person in American history had voluntarily given up power uh, like that, that centralized um, power of the majority leader, and he turned that down. Um, and most critics thought, he was insane for doing so, that why would you want to give up such power for a mundane, numbers-crunching committee uh, that has no power, um, in which case he showed them that they don't understand politics in the same way that he understood politics. But um, he took that committee and um, used its full power uh, for for a number of years for a, a number of different projects. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those. Um, but he was also the President Pro Tem Emeritus of the United States Senate for four years, and he was Chairman and or Ranking Member of the Powerful Senate Appropriations Committee for 20 years from 1989 until he passed away in 2010. Um, you know, aside from that, he, he's a personally a fascinating figure. Um, any of you meet him and any of you ever met Burr before? I know Dan's told me a really fascinating story about him and uh, the jacket and the weather, which I think is really, really cool story and very indicative of, of him. But um, most of you know that he was elected the exalted Cyclops of the Ku Klux Klan um, in uh, 19... The dates are not clear, although I think I have a pretty good narrative of his time in the Klan, but it's around 1941. Um, he leaves for Baltimore, and, and whether he leaves or not, but that's a, d a different story. He filibustered the Civil Rights Act in 1964, and um, he wrote some pretty terrible letters to uh, the most vile, racist, demagogic senator in uh, American history, uh, Theodore G. Bilbo of Mississippi. One of those letters is public. Um, three or four that are not public I have and they will be in the book and they will be published and they're just as bad as the one letter that is public. Um, this is fundamentally about the race problem for him, not communism. Um, and then later he endorsed Senator Barack Obama for the presidency over his friend and colleague Hillary Clinton. Um, and he once condemned Martin Luther King Jr. as um, a rabble rouser who on the Senate floor two days after he died uh, said, when you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Um, and then years later fought to make Martin Luther King Jr. Day a national holiday. He secured the first $10 million appropriation to have the uh, MLK Memorial put on the National Mall, um, which I think is, is pretty fascinating. He received a law degree while serving in the United States Senate. I went to school at night, often eating his dinner from um, when his wife, Irma, picked him up 
and they drove over to the to the American University Law School. He would eat dinner in the car while she dropped him off. Um, took him 10 years, and, and, and he received that law degree. Um, he was once given by the Roy Royal Shakespeare Academy a leather-bound book of all the quotes that he had given to the Senate on the Senate floor from, from memory of Shakespeare. I've seen this book. It is not a little book. It is a very thick book. Um, his memory was unparalleled. Um, but he was also a popular press book author, a legal scholar, um, published um, academic journals, academic journal articles on the line item veto and the home rule, and he literally wrote the history of the United States Senate in a four-volume book. Um, and, which someone, I thought everyone knew he was a fiddle player, but not everyone knew he was a fiddle player. I was talking to someone today in the hallway, and um, he was a fiddle player, and quite a good fiddle player at that. Um, so he, and he also played at the Grand Ole Opry. But to get to what we were supposed to talk about today, I, I went back and forth with, with Chuck about whether I should talk about the Klan stuff, because I, I know uh, Dr. David Corbin had been here previously, and he talked a little bit about the Klan uh, stuff in Bird's Life, and we fundamentally would disagree on, on this, and so, um, but I decided to talk about the appropriation stuff, because that's a little less, it's still controversial, but not as controversial as the Klan stuff. Um, but to understand Bird's time on the Appropriations Committee, you, you have to understand his life as a youngster in the coal mining community. I, at least I try to make this argument that is fundamental to, to, to this committee. Um, because I found an interview of Bird when he first got into the Senate, and they said, you know, most senators are just biding their time to run for the presidency. That's essentially what they want to do. They, they all want to try to move up to, to, to be the senator. They're all running at every single second of every day. Um, Byrd was not that guy. Um, and so what, he was asked, what, what's the highest position you could imagine in government? And he said, I want to be chairman of the Appropriations Committee. This is a long time ago, 1959. You're like, why would you want to be chairman of the Appropriations Committee? I, I, I mean... What do they do? Who, who is this? What, 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 essentially, what, what is the committee? Now, the committee controls a significant portion of the federal budget. So um, most of the discretionary spending in American government has to go through the Appropriations Committee. That's why, you know, you see the, and Byrd criticized them all the time years later when he was in the Senate. Most people want to rail these 30-minute policy clips here and there, and they want to have these policy fights and debates on the floor. I mean, and Byrd could do that, but... That's not what he wanted, it, and, and he kind of learns this from Richard Russell, the segregationist senator from Georgia, which we'll talk a little bit about in a, in, in a bit, that you want to control American government, you got to control the purse. Every single policy idea that comes through the Senate has to be funded. And so you can stand out on the floor and you can rail about immigration, you can rail about refugees, you can, you can you know, get upset over gay marriage and uh, any other hot button abortion policy issue you want to talk about. Every single one of those, most of them, have to be funded. And that goes through the Appropriations Committee to, to some extent. And so he understood that. Um, and that's, I think, why he wanted on that committee, but... Um, more fundamentally, it has a lot to do with him as a youngster growing up in southern West Virginia in the coal mining communities. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, years later, Byrd said that the mining towns were a complete authoritarian, autonomous system of government. I mean, these, these communities, not all of them that were the same, but many of them were very difficult places to live. Um, it was completely controlled by the mining community or the mining company. Um, the... Any infrastructure that existed was created to serve the mine. Um, there was no sidewalks. Most of the roads, especially the community that Bird grew up in, there were no roads. There were no paved sidewalks. Uh, no real fresh water. Um, coal runoff and human sewage polluted the water. Um, there was no hospital, but a company doctor paid with the deductions from the miners' wages. Um, there was a general store, but it, in many cases they didn't take legal currency. They took scrip um, that was given to them. Um, and so 
they were often paid with script from the mining company and it would be used in the company store and I found some stories where the miners if they tried to save a little bit of that they would be thrown out of their home they had to rent the home from the mining company um, there it's, it's 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 quite a difficult place um, many of them the, the homes were had, at some point had been painted white but the the coal dust had um, they called it coal camp gray was the color that the houses ended up being because the fumes smoked over the 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 walls and, and oftentimes it would boil the paint off the off the um the, the wall and um, they had these big piles of slate and they would often combust randomly and they would burn and so they would try to put them out sometimes they would but oftentimes they didn't because they would um start back up again and so it was resources that they didn't want to put a lot of time and effort and money into and so but those fumes would come over and it hovered over the camp they had something called a honey pot and a honey pot was you would uh, defecate in um, a hole in the ground and then this cart would come by periodically and they would dig it up and put it in the cart and then drive it along behind the hill and dump it out and so the fumes would, and the smell would just linger back up over into the camp. Um, it was a difficult place to live, and often they had water that came from a spigot, so you would have to go down to the spigot, get the water, and it was particularly difficult for the women. Um, uh, we, we talk a lot about the difficulty that men had in coal mining, but the, the women had quite a difficult time as well. Um, Bird's mother, um, I'm blanking on her name right now at the top of my head, but it'll come to me in just a second. But she would have to walk down to the spigot, carry these buckets full of water up to the house, heat them up, dump them in a tub so that the miner, so Dalton, his dad, could rinse the coal dust off of him when he got home at, at, at night. Um, Vlerma, sorry, her name was Vlerma. And um, so it was a very, very difficult place to live. Um, and during, during this time, which is also just as important for Bird, is, I mean, his family was poor, they were very poor at the beginning, and eventually they get, they get a little less poor over time. But one of the things that Bird did um, as a youngster was he helped slop the hogs. And I'm sure you've heard this phrase before, you've heard people talk about this. So essentially, it was Bird's lot to go from house to house, and he would beg these... Um, wives, mothers, folks for garbage, for the scraps, for their food scraps. And um, so that he could take these scraps and feed them to the hogs. And then at the end of the harvest, they would slaughter these hogs. And then he would give what he called a mess of tenderloins to everybody who had given them some uh, garbage. Um, sometimes he said there are a few instances where the women would hang him out on a nail on the on the side of the on the cabin, and it'd be like December and it would be frozen. He'd have to take a little chisel and pry out the frozen slop from the bucket so that he could feed it to the pigs. And in the summer, he was just a he was a very small boy, very malnutrition to some extent. Uh, he'd carry those buckets, and the the slop would splash over him, so he'd smell like garbage, and he'd smell like just foul smelling and the other kids made fun of him for this um, which made his life pretty difficult to, to some extent um, I don't have time to go into all of the difficulties of um, the unionization and the things like that that took place in the mine but but that was quite a struggle for them as well to try to get some of these uh, workplace protections for 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 these communities and eventually they did to some extent but um, just some of the conditions in the mine were 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 terrible. I mean, they they um, often died. Um, but prior to Bird's life, some of the children had been there had been protections put into place, so he didn't have to work inside the mine necessarily. Although some of the boys did, they lied about their age, and 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 they did. Um, but his dad used um, a pick and 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 coal and mined the coal for um, about three dollars per day. Is what he did. They waited at the time. And one of the ways that they had, had done this was they would take this, you would have to push this cart in there, it weighed about 300 pounds um, empty, they'd fill it with coal, they would push it back out, and then they would weigh it. You'd put a little check on it, and, and, and it was the miner's check, and then they would weigh, and then you would get paid at the end of the day. 
Um, and he, Bert said he always remembered that his dad's check was number 232. And that's important for what we'll talk about a little later. Um, so it, it, we have to fast forward quite a number of years, but um, even when Bert is leaving the coal camp, which was a little difficult. He leaves, he leaves West Virginia in 1943. He had um, a, a draft deferment, a number of different draft deferments for family, for uh, work, and he, he became a welder. He went over to Baltimore to, um, to, to weld the Victory ships and the Liberty ships. Um, he comes, he leaves there, goes to Tampa. He ends up coming back to West Virginia in about 1945. But in, in, during this time period, he had mostly been a butcher and a produce salesman, and that's what his job was, and that's what he worked. Um, but he decides he's going to run for public office eventually because he said, and these are his own words, he said he'd never thought about running for public office. And then when he was being initiated into the Ku Klux Klan, he, gets, um, he talks to this guy, this reverend by the name of Joel Baskin, and um, he comes over from Virginia and helps him put the Klan together. He, he told him if he got 200 people to sign up, he would, he, would, or he said 150, but Bird went above that and got 200. And um, so they're in the basement of this guy's house and they do the initiation ritual, they do the, they do the whole get up. And um, afterwards, this reverend takes Bird back to his home to meet, um, to meet his, uh, his wife and, and the children. And he says, you know, you're you're about 22 years old. He said, I never. He's like, I've put these, I've I've put these clan chapters together all over the place, and I've never seen a group of people respond to someone the way they've responded to you. They are enthralled with you. You are just a natural born leader. You're 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 22 years old. He said, when I asked them who they wanted to be the leader of the clan, it was unanimous that they picked you. And in this room were doctors, lawyers, I mean mine foremen, these are these are people that have education. These are these are leaders of the community. And then you've got this, you know, mostly poor coal boy who's in this um, mine. He runs produce and does this sort of thing and, and they pick him for this and he says it was kind of like lightning went off in his head I never thought about this before because the guy said you should think about running for Congress he said you, you we could use your kind of leadership in in the in the in the Congress and you should think about that and Bird said I lights went off I, I never thought about this before but but years later it, it gets back to that point um, and so eventually he decides he's going to run for office and, and again the Klan connection is there he the first person he calls when he decides to run is he calls this Reverend Baskin again and he tells him to run for the House of Delegates first. Um, he calls a few other Klan members, they convince him to run for the House of Delegates and he decides to run for the House of Delegates. And of course that's when his career kind of starts and he takes that fiddle with him everywhere and he would pull it out and he said when it would be really boring and you know you can talk. He's like people can drone you out when, when you're talking but they cannot drone out that fiddle. And so he'd play that tune and it would say, bird by name, bird by nature, let's send bird to the legislature. And then he'd pick it up and he'd play, you know, turkey in the straw and, you know, uh, whiskey, rye. And, and then he'd stop and say, I'm bird, B-Y-R-D, I'm for good schools and better roads. And then he'd just play some more. Um, and, and then he won, um, which is really kind of a fascinating story in and of itself. Um, but eventually he becomes this political powerhouse. But... Even when he's in the House of Delegates for two terms, the Senate for half, a, the West Virginia Senate for half a term, the House appropriate, and he gets to the United States Congress. That's when the Klan stuff comes out first. But he is never that have found in any of that period that he had any interest in the Appropriations Committee at all. That nothing about money. He had been on the Finance Committee in the House uh, of Delegates, but nothing, nothing of any kind of importance. Um, Never mentioned that he wanted to be on the Appropriations Committee necessarily until later after he'd won the, the, the Senate seat, but um, for the story I told you earlier, but, but never mentioned any of this. And so he, um, he wins his election to the Senate, okay? Now, the way it used to work in this time period, Lyndon Johnson was the majority leader at the time. I don't know what you know about Lyndon Johnson. Some of you probably know something about him, but he was a beast of a man. He was a very interesting man, very dominant man, um, probably a 
political genius to, to some extent, um, but he was a very intimidating man, and he ruled the Senate with an iron fist. And he had his assistant, um, Bobby Baker, who eventually did time in prison for a number of different things, um, was his kind of chief of staff. And, and he went to everybody when you first got into the Senate. I mean, in order to get on a good committee in the Senate, this is where your power is exemplified, is what committees you're on. When, when you are in the Senate, you get nothing. You get placed on these committees that nobody wants to get placed on, like um, what Bird, Bird actually did get put on, like the vending machines committee in the, ha in the Congress. Like nobody cares about that. You, you can't take that back to your constituents, right? Um, but Bird's story is, 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 is quite different. It's, it's quite interesting because Bobby Baker's coming around to all the new senators and he runs into Bird and, and he says, um, well, you know, Senator Burr, whatever it is he called, they called him Bob. Bob, what, what, what committee are you want on? And the first thing Bird says is, I want on appropriations. And Bob Baker's like, well, I don't know what to tell you. You're going to have to pick a different committee because you're not getting on appropriations. And he's like, well, I want a meeting with the big guy. And he says, well, I'm just telling you, there, there are no seats on the appropriations. You don't have the seniority. You're not getting on appropriations. It's just not the way it works. I mean, freshman senators do not get placed on the appropriations committee. There are only a few that that had happened to, one of them being Richard Russell um, in 1933. But it was a weird situation wherein the New Deal senators were coming in and a lot of folks had lost their jobs, so seniority couldn't quite matter as much as it needed to because they just weren't there. So he ended up getting a seat on that. But it's pretty rare for a freshman to get a seat on the appropriations committee. Um, so a few weeks later, uh, Bird gets a meeting with Lyndon Johnson. He goes into a room and it's just him and Johnson. And he comes out of that meeting uh, about an hour later. He says, I can't find anything out about this meeting. I've looked everywhere what was said inside the letter, but obviously you're not going to get any information about this. All that I can tell is that Johnson said something about being the third senator from the state of West Virginia. But apparently he said that to everybody. I'm the third senator from the state of Massachusetts. I mean, he said it to every single person because he was as liberal as he could possibly be to every liberal. And he was conservative as much as he could be to every other. Other um, conservative senator, I mean, Robert Caro even says that he changed his dialogue or his accent depending on the type of senator that he talked to. Um, if he was talking to a Mississippi senator, when he used the N-word, he, he gave it with the Mississippi accent. When he was now talking to the Alabama senator, he used it with the Alabama accent. So he had a way to, to, to do this. Um, but so all that I know is that when, when they, come, they come out of that meeting, Johnson says to, um, to Bert, you got to go. You got to go see the man. You got to go see the man, and he means Richard Russell. And so Bird goes to see Richard Russell, uh, the segregationist senator from the state of uh, Georgia. And you still don't know necessarily, but from what we can tell is basically what that means is Johnson's opened the gate to him. It's like if if Russell approves, you're on the committee. So of course Bird goes and and talks with him, and and um, and then Johnson had this walk, I'm not going to try to mimic it, but his hands were like dinner plates and he had this country cowboy stride and he would stride up the floor and people talked about it all the time. And he walks up to Bird because Bird is a new senator and he's in the back of the, he's in the back row and he says, your own appropriations. He said, there was another senior senator that wanted it more than you, but I stood him down and now you're on appropriations committee. So somehow, whatever they took place in that meeting, a bird gets on appropriations. I try to make the argument or at least speculate that it has a lot to do with the fact that Bird um, promises Johnson that he'll support him in the 1960 election over John F. Kennedy. He knows that 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 Johnson is going to run and he has to win West Virginia. And Kennedy, um, some of you know the story. It's like, yeah, of course, Kennedy can win this primary in Wisconsin with all these Catholics, but can he win a Protestant state? And West Virginia was the state that he had to win. And so Byrd came out early for Hubert Humphrey because he knew if Hubert Humphrey won the state, then that would send the convention into turmoil and it would go to the floor and you just couldn't beat Johnson on the floor. So he knew that he, knew that. he was there to, to, to help him do that. And um, Byrd ha has said this multiple times. There was a, a recent... Um, declassified tape that was released that Johnson calls Bird, um, and um, it's really kind of a fascinating. If you've ever heard Johnson try to work you over, it's a, it's a pretty interesting tape. 
um, but he's trying to work Bird over. And this is about the Civil Rights Act. He's trying to get Bird. He's like, why don't I send you to? Uh, why don't I send you on a trip to some foreign country, and you can take Irma, and you guys go and just not be there. And Bird, because he he keeps asking him. He's like, are you guys going to be able to um, sustain the filibuster? Or are you going to be able to keep this bill from passing? And Bird's just like, look, I'm going to give it everything I got. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to keep this bill from passing. And Johnson's like. Well, now, why don't I send you over here, or why don't you just take the day off, or why don't you not be there? And he's like, do you, and he's, do you love me? And Bird's like, of course I love you, Mr. President. And he's like, but do you love me enough to, to, to step away from this? And Bird says something really fascinating in that interview, which I don't think a lot of people pay attention to. He says, I can't carry water on both shoulders, Mr. President. And what, what I think he means by that is, I, I know what he, he says, I know what you gave me. I know you gave me the seat on the Appropriations Committee. I get that. And I am loyal to you, but on this I can't because Richard Russell is still the chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee, and he can have you removed from that committee in any way, shape, or form. So Byrd doesn't want to cross Russell, and he has to be connected to this civil rights filibuster in order to keep his seat on appropriation. So that's tied to the Klan. I mean, Byrd aligned himself with those Southern segregations, that Southern block of senators when he first came into the Senate, particularly from 1959 all the way until 1972. He's still saying pretty racist things in the Senate, uh, whether he's uh, anti-busing or wh whatever it is that, I mean, he says one thing that he believes that the Klan gets blamed for a lot of things they didn't do. And that, that we focus too much on that. But his moderation, I mean, a lot of people ask me all the time, when did Bird start to moderate? When does he start to think differently? And it's the, the last formal official act of Senator Richard Russell's Senate career is he signs a, um, a letter giving his proxy vote to Robert C. Byrd for the... Um, the majority whip position in 1973 against Ted Kennedy. Um, and, and then he dies. And then as soon as he dies, I mean, Byrd is now elected to the leadership and Byrd starts to moderate quite extensively. But Russell held that power over, the, over him for an extended period of time. Um, and so, but, 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 but anyway, so he's, he's, he's on this committee and he sits on this committee and he waits. I mean, there, there's so many different things I could tell you about this, this committee, but, um, and what, what is it he's doing on this committee? Uh, I was telling some of the, the guys here before, I found some really fascinating documents from the Jimmy Carter presidential administration that were recently declassified about some of these, um, about some, uh, stories of Byrd, right? I mean, the, the Carter, Byrd was majority leader at the time, but he was still on the Appropriations Committee. Um, and the congressional liaison, Frank Moore, said Byrd, they called him an enigma. They just didn't know how to handle him. Um, uh, one, one good story of this is, there's a young congressman by the name of Ray Hall, I'm sure you've heard of him. He just comes into the, to the House. And um, Frank Moore, who's the congressional li liaison to the White House, gets a, an appropriation a grant, gets awards, like a HUD grant. It's a really small grant. It's not, it's not that big of a deal. But he, 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 somehow he goes through the list, and rather than call Bird, he just he calls Ray Hall first. Um, so he tells Ray Hall, you've got this appropriation. It's like for some pipe or something. I can't remember what it's for. And so Ray Hall is super excited about this because, I mean, bringing home the bacon is a big deal. You get to tell your constituents that you did this. Um, he does the right thing, and he puts Bird's name on the press release when he releases it. But he doesn't call Bird's office, and, and, and the appropriation doesn't come from Bird's office. And so... Um, Bird hears about it through a constituent, like a contractor calls him and said, did you know this was awarded and it came out of Ray Hall's office? Bird was so livid that he literally picked up the phone. He called the Secretary of State of the United States of America and he keeps the Secretary of State on the phone for more than an hour talking to him about how he doesn't know that the, the SALT Treaty will make it through the Senate procedure and that he has absolute and utter control over every appropriation um, that comes to the state. He wants them to come through his office. Um, so eventually he gets to talk to Jimmy Carter about this, and Carter's like, listen, Senator, we're really terribly sorry. And, and I've got the document where Carter tells Frank Moore to lie and say 
you just tell him you were traveling and you just dialed the wrong number, just tell him something and I'll deal with it. And from now on, every appropriation will go through Bird's office first. Um, and that does happen. I mean, he, he, he keeps it that way. I mean, Bird had a complete and utter control on appropriations from the state of West Virginia. I mean, everything came through his office because he, he was on that committee. And um, it, it's, yeah, okay. Well, so by, by 1980, Byrd been on the Appropriations Committee for a little more than 21 years. And, you know, there, there's one appropriation he gets. It's a $284 million appropriation for the Tug Fork. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars for transportation literally countless amounts of substantially large appropriations to the state. And yet, he's so upset over this fact that he called the secretary and um, told them that he would literally bring the United States government and its foreign policy to a halt if the president's office didn't communicate with him about these individual appropriations. Um, now, some would say that this is a bit extreme, but for Byrd, this isn't, I, I, I mean, well, think of that what you want to think of that, but but I think that this has nothing to do with ego necessarily for Byrd, although he did have a very healthy dose of that, um, and rightly so, but, but this has a lot to do with Byrd's understanding of um, seniority and understanding of um, the position of the Senate in relation to the presidency, um, and he, he didn't see this as an as an ego. He saw it as as something completely different. I mean, Carter really often said he dreaded calling Bird because he knew that he was upset with something that he had done. Um, he was apt to say that Bird stuck a knife in his back, um, but um, anyway, that's there's a there's a lot more to to to, to do with that. Um, all right, but as he grew in power and seniority, uh, many of those announcements were accompanied by a ribbon cutting ceremony, right? Um, or a shoveling of dirt or a photo op. Um, but I mean, much of the state bears his name, which many of you know, my daughter now, when we drive through Huntington, she'll say, dad, there's bird, there, there's something to do with bird or there's something to do with bird over there. So she even knows that everything in the city is named after me. But you've got entire highway systems, multiple bridges, parks, visitor centers. Um, and you have to understand that while he's focusing on these appropriations, he's also the majority leader of the United States Senate. So he's on the floor oftentimes nine to 12 to 15 hours a day um, doing the business of the Senate where he is keeping an eye on everything. He's managing other people's legislation, but he's also thinking about West Virginia. This $284 million Tug Fork project I'm talking about almost happened by accident. So Bird was on the floor one day. He happened to look out and notice that all of those excuse me, senators that had been opposed to it weren't there. So he walks over to the majority leader, or to the, um, to the, um, to the minority leader, uh, Mark Hatfield and Howard Baker and said, what if I offer an amendment to this and, and, and I offer you this, what do you think? And, and they, they just, you know, talked amongst themselves for a few minutes, like, yeah, I think that'll be okay. And it passed. And then it went to Jimmy Carter to, to the presidency and, and he ended up signing it. But it's only because he was thinking about that. He was actually thinking about what, he, I mean, which I could talk about in just a second, but he had a list of projects that were in his mind about what appropriations were going to West Virginia. He was paying attention to that. And the thing that's so fascinating about that is the majority leader, like I said before, is running for president. They all are. That's all that they're thinking about is moving towards the presidency. Byrd didn't use his power like that. He didn't use his majority leader position to think about how do I step up to the, to the, to the presidency. He's thinking, how do I get I mean, and again, I'm not painting him in this like perfect picture that he's this completely altruistic individual. I mean, he said he would have served in the presidency if he if he could and if he were asked to do that. But he was thinking about West Virginia. I mean, you have a significant amount of power as a majority leader, and it's your prerogative to distribute that power however you choose to do that. And he chose to do this in a lot of altruistic ways. He chose to 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 distribute that power. 
Um, and this is one of those. I mean, so he's thinking about $284 million projects for Tug Fork. He's thinking about, I saw one in there that was like $13,000 for strawberry farming or something like that. I mean, so, so he, he has West Virginia in mind literally every single second that he's on the floor thinking about um, all the business that's, that's transpiring. Um, uh, the timing was perfect on this bill because it had been killed four times before. It died in the House of Representatives three times, and it was had been vetoed once. Uh, Ford had vetoed the bill once before, but it, it's like this perfect alignment where Bird said, "Now's the time," and he jumped on it because he had been thinking about it and keeping it in his mind at um, every second. And it's really great because Carter lost a few months later, and the Republicans took control. And there's no way that Reagan would have passed that had had that not been the case. Um, so that's um, that's that, that that that's a few stories of him on the appropriations committee, and now we get to the point of like what I should be talking about, which is the chairmanship of that committee. Once he takes the the leadership of that of, of that committee, um, there's a great scholar by the name of Finno who says that every committee chairmanship can be thought of as an opportunity to govern, and this is exactly what Bird thinks about. I mean. He takes this, well, first of all, he I already mentioned this, he'd given up the leadership position. And I found a bunch of internal documents that, that might debate this. You, I mean, you, you see a lot of the folks in the newspaper arguing that Bird was not charismatic on television. He couldn't fight the policy battles the way that the Democratic Party wanted him to fight them. He did this really these aren't my words, but odd, annoying thing where you would have press conferences every Saturday morning at like 8.30. And one of the only senators to do this. People did not like that. They, they wanted their Saturdays for, for themselves. And so he had these habits that, that people didn't like and he was pretty tough on everybody. I mean, his office ran like a well-oiled military type of machine. Um, and in fact, that I found this really great story about Byrd himself actually training the secretaries to answer the phone in a specific way that he wanted it answered. He would say he had, had a script and they had to prove to him that they could do it with the tone and the personality that he wanted it. And he would literally pick up the phone and say, ring-a-ding-ding, -ding, and they would have to do the exact same thing. And they'd have to give the pitch that this is the office. And many of them didn't last very long because they, they couldn't do it. He would give random spelling tests to staffers, and if they failed them, they would, they would be gone. Um, there, there was some tension with that, too, because um, one staffer starved his goldfish to death as, um, as retribution, but um, he was difficult to work with. But those that liked him and worked with him stayed for a really long time and, and, and really appreciated this uh, this, this type. But, but anyway, so there's some debate about whether Byrd gave up the chairmanship or whether it had been taken from him. I mean, he, he claims that he had the votes, that the votes were there. He knew a solid 22 votes and he needed, I can't remember the number, it's like seven or eight more votes and he would have had it. He said he knew where those votes were and he could have been majority leader again if he chose to do that. But he said, he quoted Cincinnatus, the, the, the Roman statesman, and said, I'm, and quote, unquote, I'm going back to the plow. In other words, I'm giving up, I've, I've been dictator for a long time, and I'm voluntarily giving up that power, and I'm going back to, to do this. And the media was like, why is he doing this? Why is he giving up this power? Because why would you want that for a number crunching committee? Well, Byrd had a very specific reason for why he wanted to do that. He's thinking about West Virginia. So he takes the chairmanship of the Appropriations Committee. He, he, the Democratic Party's in the majority. He's, gonna, he's the senior most member because John Stennis had retired. He's gonna be the chairman of the Appropriations Committee. He comes out, the first, one of the first things he says is, I wanna be West Virginia's billion dollar man. Do you guys remember that campaign? I mean, that was all over the state. I wanna be West Virginia's billion dollar man. And what he meant by that was, I'm gonna use my power on the Appropriations Committee to return a billion dollars back into West Virginia and back into West Virginia state uh, economy through my my power on the Appropriations Committee. Now immediately that's people are just like yeah whatever okay you, you think you're gonna do this um, but eventually he uh, starts moving in that direction to, to, to do that. A long story short about that um, he does end up getting that billion dollars. Um, he says in his first term as chairman which is a few years but he, he surpasses that in, in multiple ways. I mean, it's, I think the number is $3.22 billion that he gets in the first term. And these are projects that are, 
you know, um, the, the, the largest one is the FBI center. That's the big one. And so once people start to realize that he's serious about this kind of approach to leadership on this committee, people start to get worried about it because not only does he, I mean, he, he, it's my understanding that this FBI center plan was just kind of floating out there in the uh, primeval soup of ideas in DC and Bird heard about it and snatched it up and put it into practice and he met with the right folks to get this to take place but um, and eventually it, it, it did come about but I mean I think um, Jesse Jackson even said that he was raping DC of, of jobs. I mean, it ended up getting pretty controversial because he gets the FBI center moved to Clarksburg. Um, he gets, I mean, West Virginia had a naval center, the telescope, we, we have a Coast Guard in the state. I mean, he starts moving all these projects to the state of West Virginia. By the end of the first term, he has one third of the CIA going to come to the state of West Virginia as well. It passes the Senate, it passes the House, and it gets stalled in the um, the conference committee, but it was it almost happened. I mean, that's one of the significant failures that he had, but it wasn't that, um, wasn't that, um, I mean, it was pretty controversial, but uh, he, it, it, it didn't happen. And there was, there was actually a congressional investigation about this, that he had been pressuring um, members of the Senate to um, do his bidding. And um, there's this huge in, uh, internal congressional investigation. The report was released and ended up, he, he didn't, Bird used no influence for for this. He just kind of put the right people in the right places and, and they worked it out together, which is pretty fascinating. I mean, given that long of being in politics, no scandal. He, he had no scandal uh, for, for that um, with that type of power, which is which is kind of interesting. But again, I mean, back to his leadership on the Appropriations Committee, this is something that's even more topical now that Senator John McCain is, has, has passed away. I mean, he and Byrd went at it quite a bit over these earmarks and these appropriations. I mean, McCain believed that they were um, anti-democratic. He believed these appropriations were not in the public's interest and that most of them took place in uh, back rooms, smoke-filled rooms, and that they were corrupt, that the, this kind of appropriation was corrupt. And in some cases, that's true. I mean, you have some of these extreme earmarks like the bridge to nowhere. I'm sure you've heard of building this multi-tens of millions of dollar bridge that goes to a place that houses, I forget what it is, but it's like 50 people or something that can get back and forth. Um, and so there, there, is, there is some abuse of, of this, but uh, Bird uh, made a public pronouncement that he was going to do this. Everything was in the public and um, there was transparency was, was very important to him. Um, he said, he, he, well, I'm going to skip some of this. He, when he first met with the appropriations staff, the first thing he told them was, you have to start thinking about priorities, projects, and funding for opportunities for West Virginia. He puts together this memo and he says, I want to give special high priority to large projects, visibility opportunities. This is the FBI center. This is a federal prison to the state of West Virginia. He wants to relocate key data uh, processing systems to West Virginia, joint readiness training centers, um, arts and humanities centers, some timber bridge things. Um, highways, Appalachian construction, federal office building, he wants post office, um, and then he also wanted to work with continue funding projects that are in the state of West Virginia, like the Metal Matrix and the Appalachian Laboratory, um, and then they'll also pursue some of these um, other smaller projects. But he, he was also so actively involved with trying to recruit other industries to the state of West Virginia. I found this letter um, f to Michael Eisner. Do you know who Michael Eisner is? He's the CEO of Disney. He writes this letter to Michael Eisner and it's, it's a tourist pitch. I mean, he basically says, I know Disney's having a little bit of trouble figuring out where to locate their Civil War theme park museum. He's like, I've got the perfect place for it. It's right in near Shepherdstown. We're near uh, Battlefield of Antietam. The people of West Virginia are the best people in the world. We have low crime rates. We have low property tax. I mean, all the, he, he gives a pitch to, to these industries to come to the state of West Virginia. Um, he's thinking about these projects all the time. He's like talking about the $110 million investment and um, expanding other, other infrastructure. 
Um, just to give you a quote, he says, the most valuable resource available to any employer desiring to locate in West Virginia is her people. Um, he had a highly developed, nuanced political philosophy about what earmarks were. And he used that with the power to get these projects to come about through the Senate procedure. It was all transparent and not uh, behind the scenes. I mean, which, which is fascinating in and of itself, but um, I'll, t I'll tell you one story about what he did with Joe Biden. He, he had this acid rain amendment that he wanted. They, they'd been debating this back and forth, and Byrd had this large, multiple million dollar appropriation as an amendment that he wanted attached to this acid rain bill, and it was to retrain miners for something because it was gonna, supposed to cut minor jobs by X number of jobs. I can't remember the details of this. But he had gone through and called every single senator. He'd done all the vote counting. He knew the most of the votes that he had, and he was going to be really close. But one of the votes that he had that was secure, that said, yes, I'm going to vote for you, was Joe Biden. Okay, he, Biden told him he was going to vote for him. So it gets to the House floor. It gets to the Senate floor. They're going through the procedure and the roll call. I don't know what, what you know about the Senate, but they have these really long roll call sheets, and each senator's name's on it, and it's got a yay or a nay next to it, and they take these little pins and they circle. And so it gets to Biden, and Biden says nay, and Bird's like what? So he thought he had this vote, and you never go to the floor unless you know you had the vote. Biden voted against him. So what Bird did. I mean, he lost. He lost the vote, and the, and the acid rain, the amendment failed, or whatever. Bird took that roll call sheet. He took he took his red colored pencil. I mean, anything you see in his papers that has a red colored pencil, that's he wrote that. That's how you know he did it. He did it for years. I mean, from the early 40s until he died, he had a red colored pencil, and that's what he used. So he took that and he circled Biden's nay, his name, and then he took that really long roll call sheet. He had it framed into a nice little frame and then the appropriations committee this ornate door in the capitol i mean it's this you know multiple hundred year old door beautiful floor to ceiling he closed the door it takes a drill drills that framed roll call sheet into the door eye level right so that every single person who walks into that appropriations committee office can see eye level that joe biden voted against Robert C. Byrd. And the, the point is, Byrd's willing to lose, but are you willing to lose? And so, um, I mean, he, Biden said he had, it took him a long time to get back in Byrd's good graces after that vote, but, 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 the, but the point is, Byrd had, he, there, there's kind of like a talk around the Capitol that Byrd never like strong-armed anybody. He was very different than Johnson. I mean, uh, Johnson would, one time, Hubert Humphrey wasn't listening to Johnson when he wanted to, and Johnson walked over to him on the Senate floor and kicked him in the shin as hard as he could to get him to pay attention. And, um, and people were like, no, that never happened. And, and Hubert Humphrey, like the next day, he's like, I'll show you. He pulls up his pants leg, and you can see the bruise on his leg where Johnson had kicked him. But Bird didn't do that. Bird had a very different style. He didn't, he didn't strong arm you. It was more of that, like, his power kind of hovered about him it's knowing that like no i you you can cross bird but uh, bird's very powerful your appropriation project if you decided to vote against bird he would just make a motion in the committee meeting like oh we've got this uh river dam project here I, I don't think that's appropriate let's go ahead and cross that out so new mexico doesn't get that or arizona doesn't get that he never overtly used his power against you or was vindictive in that way but it was a it was a subtle vindictiveness and a, um and it was it was incredibly very very effective but biden said that he would sometimes you know he took you've heard the stories before about biden he'd have to take the the train back and forth to to uh, delaware all the time and um bird would schedule four votes at like 655 and the last train to delaware was seven o'clock and so biden would go to bird he called him mr leader he'd say mr leader um any chance you could schedule that vote a little earlier so i could make the train and he said bird would go look at his watch look back at me look at his watch look back at me look at his watch look back at me say nope not gonna be able to do it that's how he exerted his power. He didn't kick you. He used the rules of the Senate to, to get basically 
what he what he wanted. I mean, you have to think about how he's got this power concentrated. Not only does he have seniority, but he's also on the Appropriations Committee. Not only is he on the Appropriations Committee with all the seniority, he's on the Rules Committee, right? Um, so, w which is another conversation about what he would call the, the bird rule, and I'm sure you've heard about that, the, the reconciliation process, which is, um, Essentially, it's if if it's if it has something to do with the budget, it doesn't have it, it doesn't have to have 60 votes. It can just be up or down. Um, that's what kept the Trump administration from repealing Obamacare this last time around. Um, it had something to do with pulling some of the provisions out of the new tax law, um, but it's still very powerful. But um, he had all this concentrated power, and he used it. I think what's so fascinating about Bird is not necessarily for personal gain. Of course, he gets personal gain from that. Don't don't get me wrong. I mean, he gets to be the guy that everyone goes to and tries to get things. But um, he, he used it in a very altruistic way. He didn't use it to try and jump to the presidency or to be vindictive. He thought about West Virginia. Um, and he, he thought about other things too. But but it was mainly getting things for West Virginia. Um, let's see. I'm going to wrap up here very soon. Um, I mean, he, he was ridiculed for this approach to uh, appropriations committee. He was often called the pontiff of pork, porker of the month. There was a newspaper that called him porker of the month, and it would be like him with this little pig nose, because that's what they call earmarks or pork. Or, or, um, and he said it never bothered him. This is one of my favorite quotes of him. He said, um, it's clear. It's clear. It's clear that it did bother him. Although he always said it doesn't bother me. I just turn. I just turn my back to these people. But one time, in a moment of unguarded, um, he, he was he was really unguarded. And and uh, anyway, he blurts this out. He says um, he's like that. He calls his critics highfalutin pecker woods that always pick on me. Uh, so I think that's a that's a really good quote from him because he didn't really uh, kind of talk like that at all. Um, but, um, so anyway, there's no other chairman like him. Never any chairman has directed as much money or a number of projects back to their home state uh, with such an agenda, with such force, with such purpose. Um, Ted Kennedy has a great story too. He said he was here uh, in West Virginia campaigning for Bird one time and he got lost. He couldn't find where he was going. And he said he got on the phone, called Bird's office, and said, I'm stuck on the, the highway. I can't get where I'm going. And they were like, well, where are you? What highway is it? And he's like, the Robert C. Bird Highway. And they were like, which one? <laughs> um, but um, anyway, Bird's life and legacy as an underestimated hillbilly, which is in quotes, uh, who defy the odds, stereotypes, and intense criticism. I mean, earlier that article I mentioned about him saying he wanted to be chairman of the Appropriations Committee, the editor of that article, or the, the writer of that article mentioned that Bird would get, quote unquote, lost in the higher mathematics of, of federal budgeting, that he didn't have the intellect to do this, um, this kind of work. And um, I mean, one time Bird is when he was on the the subcommittee for the D.C. Appropriations, he's in the he's in on the Senate floor giving the budget for D.C. the entire budget for D.C. and he gives it from memory without a single note. I mean, you're talking line after line after line of appropriation. I mean, you're, you're like a hundred million dollars for this, three hundred and forty million dollars for this. I mean, multiple projects. He gives them by memory without any any note, and he knew every single note of that. So, um, it, it's 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 quite fascinating. But to tie it all back to the very beginning, filing um, f filling West Virginia with federal projects is, I think, reminiscent of Bird's early experience in the mine camp. The lessons that he learned about fairness and hard work, um, the responsibility of filling up the mine car so that the family could survive, eat, and prosper. Uh, this experience was so profound for Bird that it followed him his entire life. And I think he spent his entire life trying to fill that mine car, uh, but that mine car would be West Virginia. Um, and with whether it be federal buildings, water projects, high paying jobs, um, infrastructure, hospitals, things of this. But each earmark served as a chip of coal, a black diamond meant to fill and overflow the mine car. If Bird had a brass check, I think its number would be 304. That's it. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, 
Would President Johnson's papers have any uh, evidence of the meeting between him and Byrd? Well, um, it, it's it's possible, and John and and I've looked for what I can find online. It's really expensive to do archival research, um, but Caro Robert Caro, who's written, I mean, the definitive work on Johnson. Uh, I've gone through all of his books and everything he's had to say, and and I mean, he he mentions it, but it's not crucial to his story. I mean, what's crucial to his story is that Johnson becomes majority leader at this time period, and one of the first things he does to to kind of revamp the Senate is to change the policy that no new incoming freshman senators get really amazing appropriate or. A, a, really amazing committee assignments. And so one of the first things he does is he starts giving freshmen one amazing committee assignment and then one terrible committee assignment. And so, but he kind of uses that for his own power. So it's like, if you want a good committee assignment, you gotta be loyal to Johnson. And so, I mean, Bird is, and Bird's loyal to Johnson. He, he doesn't have any public um, disagreement with Johnson until years later, which is um, on Vietnam. Um, I did find one letter that's an internal memo that Byrd and Johnson and a bunch of other cabinet officials and, and important people were debating something to do with Vietnam. And Johnson and Byrd got into quite a heated argument about this because the public opinion had turned on this. Byrd had been a Vietnam hawk at the time. And they're arguing about it back and forth. And Byrd storms out and leaves. And um, he's literally, um, Byrd has a pen and paper out and he's writing a letter to Johnson apologizing like look I'm sorry I never should have spoken to you like that you're the president of the United States and the phone rings and it's Johnson and he's like look I just want to apologize for the way that went down everything's super stressful right now you know we're good to go but um, um, but yeah there, there's there, there's nothing I mean it, it, to me, it's probably Occam's razor. It's the sim most simplistic explanation. It's, it is loyalty that Johnson put him on the committee. Um, and it's also that they're aligned. I, I mean, I have this image in my head of them. I mean, Johnson had severe um, um, inadequacies and, and inferiority complex to some extent. And Bird had a little bit of that inferior, inferiority complex. He was very... Um, self-conscious over the fact that he didn't have a formal education in the typical sense of a formal education. I could just see Johnson being like, we're not like these Harvard boys. It's you and me. Let's stick together. You be a Johnson man. I'll be a bird man. I'll be the third senator of the state of West Virginia, but you be for Johnson. And um, I imagine that's what it is. But, but, but I doubt there's any quid pro quo discussion necessarily. Yeah, that's a good question. Any other Questions? Sure. Dr. Well, you failed to mention that the bird was responsible for Constitution Day, which is coming up soon. How, what was his role in that? <laughs> well, he played a major role in a lot of different things, and what, one of the smaller appropriations would have to do with something like that um, is to get these types of programs together. He, I don't know if there's a specific appropriation that he that he had for that, um, but he. I mean, he's 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 involved in seriously every single thing imaginable. Um, there are just there are literally lists of projects that he has that are programs and uh, water projects and dragging a creek all the way to removing and creating a new entire program to get it to the state of West Virginia. So, um, but yeah. How did he justify that? Did, you mentioned that he's. That he had his story of his life. But did he ever make the direct connection between uh, taking resources from the Republic as a whole and then shifting them to West Virginia? He did. He wouldn't call that socialism, which a lot of people might, the redistribution of wealth, but um, which isn't socialism necessarily. But he um, he did mention that quite quite often, and he had a he had a phrase, and the phrase was, "What's good for West Virginia is good for the country," or oftentimes, of whatever city it was, "What's good for Point Pleasant is good for the country," uh, what what whatever it was. And and he one particular pitch he would make at one point, Ray Hall was like chair of transportation committee, and Mollahan was on the House Appropriations Committee. Burr was. Uh, on the Senate Appropriations Committee. I mean, they had this triumvirate sense of power that West Virginia dominated. And one document I found, I mean, the, there's a formula that the, that the federal government uses to appropriate highway funds. 
And at one point, West Virginia was getting 75% of that entire highway funding. And because of them, and that's just the way it was, and that's the formula. And, and the justification was to pave a road in West Virginia is 25 times more than to pave a road in Kansas. And if you want to drive from Michigan to Disney World for your family, you got to go through West Virginia. And, you know, he... I shouldn't use profanity, so I won't, but he called them kiss your you-know-what curves in the state of West Virginia. Everybody's familiar with those, and he said they were dangerous and that they it was a matter of public safety and that you needed to do this. And uh, when I interviewed Ray Hall for the book, he talked about this a little bit, that a, a reporter had written a terrible story. He called terrible, not my word, terrible story about West Virginia getting so much of money and he said, just come with me and drive these roads and down the southern part of the state and you get just see what it's like. And he did and he changed the story. I mean, so the, the idea is that West Virginia had been excluded purposefully. There's a lot more that I, I didn't get to talk about. But I mean, with um, the timber industry and the coal industry, I mean, we didn't start taxing coal in this state until the 70s and so his kind of his argument was that you're pulling all these resources from the state and it's exploited to some extent we've been forgotten we've been left behind and this wealth and all this went to absentee owners and other states and so now it's time to make west virginia on the same par as other places i mean, I mean again i'm somewhat putting words in his mouth but based on all the things i can find that's essentially what it would be and that he believed that congress his fundamental power was the power of the purse and that the that that power of the purse was meant for the people and that as the people's representative he had a right and a responsibility to bring back to his constituents what he could bring back to his constituents and he just worked his way up the ladder through being on the right committee being in the right um, position of leadership or power that he's able to bring back as much as he possibly can and it's not his fault that other people don't get to be in the same position as him. Yeah. Is there a process <clears throat> of reconciliation that you were able to identify between Bird and the black community? You, you, you noted that there's a shift in his perspective yeah. as soon as he is able to Bur do so. But I mean, it has that? Did that reconciliation take place, or, or did it? Is it still um, um, a? Raw. Serious, uh, devices. <laughs> I, I think it is for a lot of people. I mean, if you look at social media, I mean, this this came out in the 2016 campaign, right? Remember when um, candidate Trump said that David Duke supported him? He's the former, whatever the title is, of the highest person for the Ku Klux Klan and Grand Wizard, whatever, whatever it is. And he supported Trump, and Trump didn't disavow him. And so then it was a few days later, Trump was like, you know, I don't know what white supremacy is, but then the, the narrative became a picture of Hillary Clinton giving Bird a kiss on the cheek at his birthday party that she had had for him, that she had thrown for him. And it's like, well, Hillary supports Ku Klux Klan member as well. And so then there was kind of a national debate back and forth about, you know, what do you do with a, a figure like Bird who said some of the most vile, racist, disgusting things I've ever written and read um, to someone who is being eulogized by the first African-American president of the United States who said of him, his quote unquote, his life bent towards justice to, to, to take Martin Luther King Jr.'s quote of the moral arc of justice. I mean, that's a pretty glowing uh, amount of praise, but um, is there one specific moment? I, d I don't know what that one specific moment is. I, I found an interview with someone that said that he kind of started, I mean, he was very rigid human being and very intense person, but he started to loosen up a little bit when his grandson got killed in a car accident in the 80s. Um, that, you know, he'd be in a meeting talking and be bird as best bird could possibly be. And then when everyone would leave, this one aide was there and he would just collapse into the floor in tears. He was just devastated by the death of his grandson. And so some people would argue that the loosening up of that is there. And then bird himself even gave an interview where he said, when my grandson died, I could just imagine like the, the you know, these, these, the, these African Americans, these people have feelings the same way I have towards their children, the same way that I have towards mine, and so you can go from there. But um, there's no one specific moment because I mean he's still doing and saying racist things for 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 years. And when you think about it, he, he 
he recognizes this and he tries to like pitch it in certain ways, especially when Clarence Thomas was nominated to the Supreme Court. Um, there's a, there's some debate back and forth. I mean, Byrd says, I'm going to support him. I'm going to support him. I'm going to vote for him. Because when um, uh, Thurgood Marshall was nominated to the court, Byrd strongly opposed this. I mean, he voted for Thurgood Marshall to be on whatever district court it was that he was on, but when it came to the Supreme Court, Byrd would not vote for him, and he didn't vote for, um, who was the, the Jewish guy that Johnson nominated? He didn't vote for him either. These are, these are clan ideologies to some extent. And then he ended up not voting for Thurgood Marshall, and then when, when um, when Clarence Thomas was nominated, he said, I'm going to vote for him. And then when Anita Hill's argument, I mean, Bird stood on the floor and said, I believe Anita Hill. I believe that woman. I'm not voting for him, which some could argue is him still adapting this racist ideology that black men are these sexually aggressive individuals. Um, and that's why I'm not going to vote for him. But he never voted for a black person to be on the Supreme Court. He voted for lower courts all, all the time, but he, he didn't do that for the, for the Supreme Court. Um, so you have that aspect of the of the, the the race problem, but and then people are still just like, nope, he's a former Klan member, always a Klan member. I mean, and Bilbo said this in one of his interviews. I mean, once a Ku Kluxer, always a Ku Kluxer. This is a sacred oath that you take that you don't get to deviate from. But then there are those on the other side, like uh, I think John Kerry, and then to some extent the, the argument that I make in the book is, I mean, Bird's life is kind of indicative of of American history. I mean, we we are, we are birthed in racism. We're birthed in this notion that I mean, our Constitution is this compromise between white supremacy and 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 this other other concept. And Bird is definitely participating in that. And then um, he somewhat changes, and then he has he starts to fund. A pro he starts giving appropriations to uh, programs that um, help these communities. Um, and so is that enough of a reconciliation? There's a National Book Award winner by the name of Ibram Kendi who he wrote Stamped from the Beginning, which is the definitive history of racist ideas in America. It's a pretty good book. But um, I interviewed him and asked him this very question, like, is this enough? And he's just like, look, I don't, I don't know. This is it's super complicated for him. I mean, he did all these racist things, and he did all these anti-racist things at the same time. He he spent decades funneling money into programs that helped these communities, but yet at the same time, I mean, he comes from a different generation. In 2003 on Fox News, he, he uses the N-word multiple times, and the, and the interviewer is trying to give him a break and say, whoa, 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 that's not what you mean. He's like, no, I'm using this word. This is what I mean. Um, and so again, he steps back from it, says, "Oh, I'm sorry. It's just from my youth. I don't understand. You know, it's it, it's a different it's different for me." But so like, I don't know. I mean, it, it's it's a really great question. There's no one definitive moment. There are lots of little moments of him doing anti-racist things, and then lots of little moments of him doing somewhat racist things. I mean, he's supporting anti-busing into the '80s to some extent, and and, and saying things like, "The problem with." forced busing is that you have white schools that function on this education level and you have black schools that function on this education level. If you put the blacks with the whites and force them, you're going to bring down the educational value of this community and this school. I mean, that's, that's a pretty racist statement. So, um, but I mean, then you have people like John Lewis from the, in the House of Representatives, a major civil rights icon, saying things that Byrd was thought deeply about these racist issues and tried to change this. And and in the um, in the mid '90s, when Trent Lott was the Senate Majority Leader, he said something about Strom Thurmond about him being I forget what it is that he said. But it was a firestorm. It's like, no, no, no. This guy was a staunch segregationist. There's no good redeeming value to this man. And immediately it was like, well, what about Byrd? You know, he's a Democrat. He's this. And so I found some documents. So it's like Strom Thurmond's voting record, Byrd's civil rights voting record, Trent Lott's civil rights voting record. I mean, he was the campaign was prepared for this kind of thing. And you know, who voted for this and who voted for what and what's racist and what's anti-racist and what's supporting of civil rights and what's not supporting of civil rights. He was prepared for that. I mean, Trent Lott ended up losing his job over that. He lost the, ma the majority leader position over that. And yet Byrd comes out unscathed from this. And, and from what I can tell and what I found, it simply 
I mean, I might be wrong about this, but it simply hinges on the fact that Strom Thurmond said, I have nothing to apologize about. And Bird said, I've apologized a thousand times for this. Like, he's like, I can't imagine, when I look back on this, I can't imagine, right? I mean, the quote that everybody knows is that he writes Senator Bilbo in this letter that got found in this, this D, um, classified document. And the letter says that, Bird would rather die a thousand, this is like 1945, so he's not a public figure, he's just a person who lives in Crab Orchard, and he says, um, the, um, how, how does he say it, he says, I would rather die a thousand deaths and see old glory trample underfoot than serve alongside um, an African American. He said they are, a, I think he calls them, quote unquote, a throwback to the blackest specimen of the wild, and is that they're a detriment to Christianity and civilization. I mean, it's a terrible, terrible letter. When that becomes public in the 80s, he says, look, I, I mean, I can't, first of all, I think he lied. He says, I don't remember writing that, which with a memory like his, you remember writing that letter. There's no doubt about it. You remember writing that letter. But having said that, he says, if I did write that letter, I don't remember it, but if I did, I find those words disgusting, and I can't imagine a person who would have written something like that. I can't even see or feel those concepts anymore, and I'm deeply sorry that I did that. I'm sorry for the people that I offended. I have a po he says, and this is what I think is really important, is that he says, I've apologized a thousand times for this, and I don't mind apologizing a thousand more times for it. So, I honestly don't know it other than just the willingness to say I'm sorry and the willingness to continue to apologize for it rather than deny it or say I don't have anything to to deny or it could be like what some other uh, members of this party in this group would say is that old bird gets a pass but none of the Republicans get a pass so it's really up to you how, how you see that but um he seems to be the only one who's apologized for this. I'm, I'm sorry I did this. I'm sorry I said this. It was a terrible time in my life. I got caught up in it. I was born and raised in a place that wasn't very far from Reconstruction. And so a lot of those ment that, that mentality was there. So it, his mom, Vlerma, took in boarders from like the Cumberland Gap and they were coming up to work the mines. And they had, and he says he learned a lot of this racist ideology from them. They would come up there and tell him all these stories, and, and that's where he learned it from. And I interviewed one guy who said, from the southern part of the state, who said they used to, now whether it's true or not, uh, I don't know, but, what, but, but, this, but the mentality of it seems to be true, is that um, people believed it to be true, which is what I think is important. There was this train that ran through... Um, I forget this the the, the town, um, but but it ran through there, and there was a cliff up off the top of the cliff, and he said the the guys used to stand up on top of that cliff, and 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 African Americans used to ride that train from one town to the next, and they would go into people's yards and ask for food. And Bert even tells a story about this in his autobiography, that this African-American man comes into the yard, it's just his mom there, and he says, can I have some food? And, um, and she says, yeah, I'll give you some food. And she leaves, and she goes and gets the food and comes back, but then the guy eats it and leaves. And Bert said he, he noticed that she had, she went in and got the food, but she also got a pistol and put it in her pocket. Um, and so, so he tells about this happening as well. But he says they used to stand up on top of this cliff and when, because of the rail cars and they were open and that they would just shoot them for sport. You could see them on there. They'd shoot them and, and, and they would just drop to the ravine and no one's looking for them, so no one's missing them kind of thing. So whether that's a true story and there are a bunch of dead bodies in that ravine or dead black bodies or whether just the idea was there, I mean, he grew up with this perspective that this group of people are not equal to this group of people and that kind of is in there and it took him a really long time to unlearn that I think um, yeah that's one more one quick question sure. we'll run a little late. in your comments you, you, you in your remarks you, you mentioned that you came across a letter or a memo or other document just curious where are the various places where you have found letters and sure. memos and other documents that are what I call original material that's a, that's a good question. Um, the Byrd Center for Congressional, I forget the title, they just changed it. It's the Robert C. Byrd Center for Congressional Education and History or something. I hope they don't see this in though, because I've been there like a million times. In Shepherdstown, they have a lot of this information. That's mostly where I've been. Um, a lot of the presidential libraries have digitized a lot of stuff. And so all the way back from Eisenhower when he's in the House of Representatives, because that's his first, 
Well, he, he meets he meets Harry Truman for like a couple days. So he gets sworn in on January 3rd, and then Harry Truman leaves on January 20th. Though, so there's not much there. But uh, Eisenhower and then the other presidential administration. So a lot of their their work is digitized. Um, but the letters that I found to Bilbo, which are these these really terrible letters that the public hasn't seen yet. They're only aware of one. I mean, I have like seven to eight of, the, of letters that he corresponded with this senator for years. I mean, they were writing back and forth about how to oppose equality for African Americans, and he's starting this new organization to help. I mean, the purpose of the new organization was to oppose African American equality, and this is 1946, and he launches his first campaign in February of, of, two, of 46. So those come from Senator Bilbo's library in uh, Mississippi. Um, so I found some stuff here um, through the newspapers, like some of the West Virginia newspapers are, are here. And I came, there's one letter that he wrote in 1942. Um, there's, there's basically the black attorney from Raleigh County is arguing that African Americans should have better access to public goods and equality after the war and bird and it's in the it's like an opinion piece and then bird responds to that in a reader's letter to it and it's a pretty terrible letter i mean in that letter he specifically says that this guy should be thinking less about things he can get and more about saving his very neck and it's a direct reference to um lynching i mean it's 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 really really clear he says put a price on it which is referring to the auction block of slavery and uh, the neck which is direct call to, to lynching um, which I, that's why I don't understand the like diminishing of his racist ideology or, or, or to say, oh, the Klan wasn't the Klan or that Bird was only in the Klan for a minute, which, which isn't true. But um, it, to me, it's, it's a better narrative. I mean, this guy was one of the most racist individuals you can think of in terms of the rhetoric. And yet to, 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 to go from that and switch all the way over to an individual who's fighting, who's, who says literally like, I, hey, I was really wrong about Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> that guy turned out to be pretty good and, and I was wrong about that. And here's a bunch of money to help fund these programs that help these individuals. That's a much better narrative and a much better story than I was kind of involved in the Klan, but I wasn't racist. I was really in it more for the anti-communism. Uh, uh, but, but again, I mean, I'm not a politician, and I don't. I'm not subject to the public in that sense, so I don't know what's best. But, um, but yeah. So to answer your question, there are a lot of places that have this, and the Bird Center is really great about um, having access to that. I mean, the the material that's there, everything is processed and it's very organized, and they have a great finding aid, and you can search. So I mean, he literally has a file that says KKK, and you can get most of the stuff from from that file. No, a lot of the stuff they don't have digit. They do have some stuff digitized. A lot of his speeches and photos and things like that. But um, they don't digitize a lot of it because it has personal information from people, like addresses and names and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Theodore G. Bilbo. He was governor of Mississippi for years, and then he was also a senator from Mississippi. He was ex he was expelled from the Senate. One of the few expulsions. I mean, his race right about the time Bird's writing him. He's he, he says to the Mississippi during a re-election campaign, look, you know, I mean, the, the all-white primary had just been ruled unconstitutional, and they were freaking out about it. And so he goes back to, to Mississippi, and he's like, look, we've got to draw the color line tighter. I mean, we have a, an obligation to the Caucasian race in the South. We have to keep these people from voting, and the only way to do it is the night before. And this is a quote from him. The only way to do he uses words I'm not going to use, but the only way to keep these people from voting is to do it the night before. And every red-blooded American knows what I mean by that. And if you don't know what I mean by that, you're just plain dumb. And so that's kind of the quote that he uses. And violence breaks out all over Mississippi for this. There are lots of lynchings and, and people that are being intimidated and not able to vote. He comes back to the Senate the Republicans take control of the Senate that year, and when they're doing the roll call to seat the senators, um, it just gets thrown into chaos, and they somehow, they pause it. They pause the roll call. They have to do is say his name, and he's seated for the year, and then you've got to do the impeachment proceedings to get rid of him, which you need like two-thirds vote to do. Not going to happen. And so they pause somehow. I forget exactly how the details of it work and how the parliament parliamentary procedures transpire, but his name 
they, they just stop and don't call his name and then it becomes this huge traumatic thing and um, he just th there's a compromise again I mean we've always com always compromised with white supremacy but we compromise with him and he basically says I'll go back to Mississippi while you guys work this out you don't have to seat me I'll just go back I still get to collect my pension the doctor says I'm kind of sick and I'm gonna have a surgery and um, he goes home, and then within a few months, he dies of mouth cancer. So it doesn't really it doesn't really matter. But I mean, all intents and purposes, they did not seat him that that year. And around that time, when this public trial was taking place because of the violence, so the argument is he was he perpetuated violence towards these people and intimidated them from into vote, keeping them from being able to vote. And so the Senate was like, this is unacceptable. And so that's why they're not going to seat him. And this is after some other corruption trial. He was taking bribes from um, from contractors, but that's not what got him. It was the the racial rhetoric. I mean, he did some really crazy things on the Senate floor. Like, there's one scene he's de debating back and forth, and he's just like, one senator from New York's trying to get him to yield to him, and he won't yield. And he's just like, "Will the senator yield?" And Bilbo just keeps going on and on. And finally, he's like, "I yield to the in loving senator of New York." And the Senate's just like, whoa, and they just, they freak out about me. He was a pretty vile, uh, racist demagogue, and, um, and, and something about that appealed to Byrd. I mean, because Richard Russell was in the Senate at the time, and Byrd even says years later that, like, you know, Russell was definitely against the anti-lynching bill. He was, I mean, he was a segregationist till the day he died. I mean, he never backtracked on this. He never said segregation was wrong. He never said white supremacy was wrong. He supported it up until his death. Um, and I searched Russell's papers and I had some graduate assistants go to Russell's papers in Georgia and there's just nothing there from Byrd. It's, it's only the letters to Bilbo. And what I did find in some Klan research is that the Klan specifically sent out basically memos to all their members across the states. It's like, you need to write Bilbo about this and keep encouraging him to keep saying the things that he's saying. And right about the time they tell the Klan members to do that in the, in the about 1944-45, Byrd does it. So I think he's still connected to the Klan in that sense. And he, he's writing them. I mean, there's something about Bilbo that appealed to him that he liked. But when this trial takes place with Bilbo, it's about the time he's launched his campaign for the House of Delegates and either I can't find those letters or those letters don't exist or he's, he's stopped writing Bilbo because he's going up and down the hollers fiddling his way to the, to the State House. So, um, but, but yeah. Any other questions? Any other final word? He's a fascinating person I, and I hope to finish the book and it's... Um, I hope it's as good as everyone wants it to be. <laughs>